Hey, everybody, welcome into the Husker 24 7 Hoops Cast, the only mm. podcast on the, uh, the Husker 24 7 channel that focuses entirely on basketball, as we will hear today. There's a lot going on at Husker 24 7, but there's a lot going on with basketball as well as Nebraska mm. picked up a critically important win on Sunday against Michigan State and in the house to see it as he is for most of the games, Brian Christofferson, and in the house for all of these podcasts as well. Brian, that was a big, big needed win for Nebraska and quite frankly, for Fred Hoiberg. Yes, it was uh, It was one of those deals after Minnesota where I felt like um, the fan base, even though it's relatively early in the season, was starting to kind of turn a little bit away from the television and like maybe I'm going to go uh, look at my Christmas tree or do whatever I got to do that's not basketball related. But I'll okay. I'll keep one eye on this game Sunday, and uh, we'll see what they have. And they came out and they they did the the detailed items that they didn't do in the second half in Minneapolis, and played great offensive basketball in the second half to shoot sixty five percent. And uh, it's like, all right, pulled everybody right back in, eight and two. Remember before this uh, before this stretch started, Schaefer with Creighton, Minnesota, Michigan State, Kansas State. I think. I said it'd be if they could go two and two during that that point, um, they'd be in a pretty good position. Well, maybe not the road we expected them to travel. <laughs> not me. And they Certainly haven't done it me. yet. They haven't done it yet, but they've put themselves now in position to play a big one in Manhattan on Sunday afternoon. And if you could get that one, I'll tell you what, overall I'd feel all right about where they're at. Yeah, I mean it's it's amazing what and some of it is you do it to yourself, right? Like every game becomes a referendum on not yeah. just the season, but on the totality of the Fred Hoiberg era and the collective Nebraska basketball experience. And that's just sort of how it is when you have a program that just has strained for years to, to come close to even just a, a modicum of success. But the way that it looked was so bad against Minnesota that it was hard for me to imagine that this team was going to show up and and play the way that they did against Michigan State. And I want to I want to get this out of the way because one of the guys I've been really critical on this year, and he had, I thought, an important role in, in Nebraska's win against Michigan State. And that's CJ Wilcher. I mean, he he came up with some big shots. He came up with some big baskets in that game. I still think he's a massive liability on the defensive end. But if you can get a couple critical three-pointers from him a game, and that was a big part of why. You know, they weren't able to beat Creighton. They weren't able to, to hang with Minnesota. They just couldn't make shots from the outside. Wiltshire had a couple big shots on Sunday, and he had some moments where he really kind of helped, you know, Nebraska. He got some points in the paint, too, on, on transition, on fast breaks. I mean, so I I uh, I at least want to acknowledge that I have been hard on C.J. Wiltshire, but they don't win on Sunday without him playing like he does coming off the bench. He's always one of those critical wild cards. Whatever you think of his game, he always matters. I feel like to whether it's going to go good or bad for Nebraska, a lot of times in, especially in league play, because if he pops in and he hits a couple threes and um, just adds that on Sunday, it was 10 points. But if he adds like eight points or something like that, it always is just like a huge, you know, thing for this team kind of tips it a little bit. And so, yeah, he had a, he had a nice game. Um, really everybody uh, on the offensive end, they played with pace, but this time, as Hoiberg said, I want them playing with pace, but also there's certain times where you need to have patience within the offense. And um, earlier in the season and some of the games where they weren't as good, maybe they weren't letting some things develop. And they got a lot of nice looks at the bucket, too, in this game where, you know, Rink Mass had six assists and uh, there was a little bit of a Derek Walker flavor. Uh, to his game he didn't put the ball on the deck as quick he said this game he kind of waited for things to uh, surface and develop and then and then he would start his action on the play uh, and it paid off and and on one of those was Wiltshire where they found late in the game and I didn't know if he traveled honestly uh, he, he he made a few moves around the rim but he, he they didn't call he it the pivot and, foot I watched yeah, he, it I watched yeah. it when it happened I was like how is this not a travel well he actually yeah. kept the same pivot foot he just yeah. worked all the way around, like when you're a kid and you first start playing <laughs> basketball and they work on your footwork and they make you pivot all the way in a circle, that's essentially yeah. what he did. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't know for sure what, if he did or didn't, but that's you, 
you will go with what you said. I think that's fine. And he, he got the bucket. That's all that matters. And uh, he had a nice game. So, um, and then Jawan Gary, we could just lead into that. I mean, Jawan hits the highest degree of difficulty threes, and then he's had a few air balls when he's open, but his shot is much improved. Um, and you know, the fact that he uh, was eight of 11 from the field and had 20 points and he played 36 minutes. I mean, he, he was a workhorse in that game and, uh, as What's good as level the- of concern about that shoulder though, cause I immediately, every yeah. time they showed him, he was grimacing and that's his right shoulder. And so the surgery was on the left shoulder and generally, and I don't, I don't remember what his injury was last year. But usually if you tear or do something to one side of your body in the shoulder, it, you're more susceptible to having injuries in the other one. It's just a way that your body will naturally do things. Like people who tear a labrum in their right arm because they throw baseballs also often tear labrums in their left arm because they've changed the way that they lift stuff. Like that's mm-hmm. I, I know this from personal experience and from talking with doctors about it. So I was immediately like, oh no, hopefully everything's okay there. Because he was at least on television, like anytime they cut to him, he looked like he was just like working through it. And Hmm. I think that shows how tough he is because I think he really had to grind that out where, where his pain was with everything. And maybe it's just a discomfort more than pain. Yeah. I don't know. You know, that's one of those deals. You know how this goes when you're sometimes covering it. You don't see, you you can't see it as easily. Yeah. yeah, You don't see some of that stuff uh, that you see on TV. So I didn't even know about that, but um they didn't talk I mean, about it they must he would, be at least okay he, he was in the post game and all that and was yeah. just talking like a normal game but um something to monitor perhaps but he uh i mean 36 minutes and just he was a dog out there and I, the way i would frame it is michigan state's big three uh you know like malik hall tyson walker and i consider hoggard one of their better guys um they played okay like Izzo would say those guys played okay but i thought Jawan Gary was as much a problem for Michigan State as anybody from Michigan State was for Nebraska. And that's a real compliment because usually there's one or two guys for the Spartans that sort of separate from whatever Nebraska has. And um, I I felt like Gary kind of evened that out. And they did a nice job on Tyson Walker. I know I'm bouncing around, but, um, you know, Walker ended up with 17 and he got going late and it looked like he might push Michigan State over the top. But he only had two at halftime, and it wasn't just like a full 40-minute effect from him. And uh, so they were able to negate him for half of it. And then, as as Izzo said, uh, their bigs got clowned in this game. I mean, um, some of the guys they have high hopes for, uh, Nebraska just owned them. I mean, Rink had 14 boards, and um, they, they there's a lot of soul-searching going on with that program in East Lansing. Um, and I bet they'll figure it out and still be, you know, how they are. They they'll get to the tournament and do something and, um, all that before we knock Michigan state and say, well, they're not typical Michigan state. I mean, they were ahead of Arizona by three points with three minutes left and they were right there with Duke. So they've still got material. They're just not being, they're struggling right now to finish things off and, and have that like extra piece they need to get over the top. And Nebraska was able to expose that. Yeah, I I think that Michigan State is a good matchup for this version of Nebraska. I wonder how relative that will play out for the rest of the Big Ten because I don't know that there's going to be a lot of teams that they can just body up the way they did the Michigan State bigs. But Rink Mast answered a big question for me on Sunday because I felt like out of those two losses to Creighton, um, I kind of looked squarely at him as someone like, okay, this is kind of your first go around against the best teams that you're going to play. And this is what the schedule is going to look like. And you've been great against teams that you are more comparable to what you played with Bradley. But what is it going to look like when you've got to, you know, go inside and play inside against Big Ten bigs? And Minnesota ate them up. Uh, Ryan Kalkbrenner ate them up. But against Michigan State, he he showed up. And we haven't even mentioned Josiah Alec didn't play yeah. on Sunday. And, and so he was out. And I thought Rink Mass really kind of answered the question of, can this guy play against Big Ten competition with his performance against Michigan State? You're not going to get that every week, but that should give him some confidence that he absolutely belongs on the court in Big Ten play. And I don't think that there should have been a lot of question about it, but the way and how poorly that Minnesota game went 
And we will uh, we'll dive into that a little bit after the break. Just, you know, what you thought from there, if you have long term concerns, whatever. Uh, but I, I thought rink mass, that was really, really important. And then the other thing I thought that came out of this, that's really big. I worried after the Creighton game and after the Minnesota game that Nebraska doesn't really have like they have a nice collection of pieces, but they don't have like a, an alpha. And I feel like your best basketball teams need that one guy that things can kind of either channel through or in the moment can collectively pull everyone together and and, you know, tell them that you're going to get through. this. I mean, Derek Walker and Sam Grisell were those guys for Nebraska last year. I think Jawan Gary is that guy for Nebraska this year. And I think he is sort of in that role now. I think that's why he's going to end up starting more, not just because Alec was hurt, but I think you kind of need him on the court to sort of be the, I don't want to say general because he's not the point guard, but he's, he's kind of your, your emotional leader, I guess, if you will, in that sense. Uh, and I think they sort of needed that because to me with both Creighton and Minnesota, when Nebraska got spun out, there was nobody on the court that was pulling people together and, and getting them, you know, in the right spots or, or leading them, leading them through it. Cause I just don't know that they have a natural version of that for this team. And it might be Jawan Gary. What do you think about that? Uh, that's possible. I think, I think in some ways on the court, he's that guy. I think rink mass might be like the, gather mm-hmm. everybody around guy like uh, when you're going to the huddle and stuff uh, others can do it too i think bryce williams has developed into that t- as well but i i your point is well understood um i rink is sort of a, a i wouldn't say a spokesperson but after the games it feels yeah. like he sort of has a he's kind of a player's voice for this team and and the, and where they're at so um they're they're building that chemistry i mean one of the encouraging things to hoiberg was he thought that was their best uh, huddle game of the year where like mm-hmm. in between breaks, they were, everybody was on the same page. They were taking constructive criticism well, and there was just dialogue that was ongoing that was uh, helpful to their cause. And so that was something last year's team for whatever warts they had or where they were deficient, they were really good at. They, they had a togetherness and were able to um, when teams had a 10 to run, they didn't let it become a 17 2 run. And that was what was worrisome in, in Minnesota. Mostly Schaefer was there was that, that moment where this team wasn't able to stamp out like an eight Oh run and say, all right, that's enough, you know? And um, so this was nice to see on Sunday. They never let Michigan state really get a lot of tread. They just didn't like Spartans would sometimes score five or so, but then Nebraska would have an answer and a nice offensive set. And, um, and the free throws. I mean, I know it's, you know, they were 13 of 15. They like hit their last 11. I think they hit eight of eight in the final two minutes. It's just a different ball game than some. Yeah, doesn't that feel nice? Like, you know, yeah. that these guys go into the line you're like, yeah, they're going to make these. That's what they do. Two, and then, one then and they one. do. Then they go out and they yeah. actually make them. Yeah. Two one and ones in the last 31 seconds yeah. or whatever. Critical. And if he, those are four points there. And if, you know, if you miss, both of those like we've seen in the past that Michigan state has got a chance, probably the way the math works out to tie or whatever and send the thing to overtime and win it. So Nebraska just completely um, dashed their hopes by just, it, I mean, all net on their free throws. And it got to the point where I was actually surprised it wouldn't have mattered. I'm sure. But Izzo just like with 20 seconds is left is like, all right, that's it. You guys are hitting your shots. We're going home. So uh, before we go to break, I want to ask this because it was a realization I had while watching it. And I don't particularly enjoy watching Michigan State games because I get tired of watching Tom Izzo work officials. I realized that if I was ever a coach, I would a thousand percent be that guy. Just demonstrative, (laughs) constantly whining, should probably get a technical a game, but don't somehow. I would hope that I don't, but. I probably would cross the line more than Izzo does. I, I'm curious what it's like for you as a, as a veteran who's watched a lot of college basketball, watched a lot of college basketball personalities and coaches. Where do you come down on Tom Izzo? Because I feel like pre the Big Ten, there was a lot mm-hmm. of Nebraska fans that kind of Michigan State, you kind of like, like the workman-like program. And now I kind of get tired of seeing Tom Izzo work the officials all <clears throat> the time. By the way, there was a point early in the second half where Michigan State had their third foul. And I don't think they fouled again for 12 minutes after that. That was Izzo completely lost his mind. There's a goaltending thing. 
Um, I could do a whole Stephen Bardo commentary right now. He was on one during that entire game. Uh, but I, I'm very curious your thoughts on Tom Izzo. Um, I like Tom Izzo. Uh, now, during the game, if you're rooting for the other side, he would completely get on your nerves. He's good at what he does because he knows. Yeah, I think he's a great coach. No, I mean, but obviously that. But he's got like he knows he's got leeway because oh, he's yeah. a Hall of Famer. Because there was one time he came out to like mid court almost. I know. To, to yeah. talk, and I'm thinking like that's anybody else gets teed up. But you're right. He bends the ear, and uh, things tend to go the other way for a little bit. And um, so he's effective at it. He knows uh, his voice matters to those officials and, and what he's done and all that. And so then there's that part in the game where it's like, man, this guy's all over the court. He's kind of frustrating if you're – and then you go in the post game and you you really like him. <laughs> like, oh, he's, he is fantastic. He is like, fantastic uh, in the post game, yes. And he's very – you know, he's always complimentary in Nebraska. And, of course, some Husker fans would say, well, yeah, that's because usually they're beating Nebraska and that's the old like, oh, so-and-so is doing a great job here sort of commentary from the other coach. But um, he was gracious after the game and and said, you know, Nebraska hit tough shots. And uh, you could tell, though, he was, he was pretty depressed about where his team's at right now. And uh, he was talking about his son, Steven, getting some – he's a walk-on, you know, getting some reps as, as one of the – because right now they're they're just searching for answers. Um, so they've got three really good players, and then they've got a lot of question marks. And uh, that was a very discouraging result for him and his team, and you could tell. Um, but yeah, he was he was good in the post game about Nebraska, and uh, he thinks Nebraska has a good team. He also, I think both Hoiberg and Izzo think Minnesota has a better team than some people think too. But we'll see. Uh, before we get to break, one last question. How did they follow up the Creighton halftime act? Oh, they had dogs. <laughs> they had dogs. Catching Frisbees. Yeah, the Frisbee dogs. Uh, yeah, yeah, they were catching Frisbees. Uh, you know, one of the dogs was ha- didn't have a great night. But <laughs> it was an off night for the dogs. Yeah, dog. it goes to your, it was like watching the Vikings offense on Sunday. But um it goes it goes to your point um that who cares like the dog was running trying and he tried to one time you know there were two frisbees and he tried to pick it up and struggle a little bit to get both and then he got them and everybody's like yeah that's great for him even though he's like one for his last six on catches so um i mean that's the thing like they they should just roll dogs out there like every time with their little you know they have their little socks on like their little and that just adds to it. That's just adorable. Yeah, they're adorable you know? looking. What are you going to yeah. do? Yeah. All right. I, I felt like that was a question that I needed to ask. So let's uh, let's take a quick time out here. When we come back, we will get into the Minnesota loss. Uh, and what's next for Nebraska with Kansas State? Talking basketball here. Mike Shaver, Brian Christofferson, Husker 24-7. BC, that Minnesota game, you were there. You were, you were on the scene. Mm. And... It, you know, we could do the whole tale of two halves things. We could, we could, you know, discuss a lot, but I'm just going to throw it open to you and you go wherever you want to go. What did you see in the barn in the second half? And how concerned are you that this is a version of Nebraska that we could see throughout conference play? Uh, most concerning was on the defensive end to me, even though the offense was a mess, the defense is where it started and there was no, they weren't as rink mass likes to say, you got to hit the other guy first. And I was um, surprised and disappointed at how easily Minnesota was just um, retrieving boards. They had 13 offensive rebounds for the game. It felt like they had a 10 or 11 of them in the second half. And it was a lineup with, that was mostly without Dawson Garcia. You know, he only played like six minutes because of his in, he got injured and didn't have any points. I would tend to agree Minnesota has some players that are developing who I think they might be a little better than people think, but they didn't have any hope going into it really at halftime. It felt like, and Nebraska allowed them in the first couple minutes on some bad possessions to be like, Hey, we could do this, you know? And that's the, that's where they kept talking after the game Huskers did about killer mentality. And it's absolutely right. That's what was, you're just like stomp on their throat in the first four minutes of that second half or even just play a neutral first four minutes where you it's five to five score, you know, 
Nebraska wins that game by double digits because Minnesota, I really think, would have uh, packed it in at some point or, you know, accepted their fate. And uh, Nebraska way too easily because they just weren't aggressive. Enough. I didn't feel like physical enough on the defensive end allowed Minnesota to believe. And when you let a team believe, even guys who haven't done a lot in their careers start thinking, oh, okay, I can do it against these guys. And they did. And we, we spent a lot of time talking about Jamarcus Lawrence and his evolution from being kind of a shooting guard to having to be the point guard for this team because of the way the roster is constructed. That was by far his worst game, I think, of his career in Minnesota. I mean, he just was out of sorts, and they did a nice job pressuring him. He had his pocket picked multiple times. Um, and I, I got really concerned from that game alone, like, hey, can this guy – can Nebraska actually go into the season, the Big Ten season, with no point guard? Like, he got absolutely worked against Minnesota. I don't recall or feel like it was as bad against Michigan State, but do you have some concern that they just lack mm -hmm. that true point guard? Uh, they handled the ball pressure well at the end of the game. Uh, they got to the free throw line and they made free throws. I still really like Jamarcus Lawrence, so I don't yeah. want to, like, I don't want this to be a, oh, you know, they need to do something different, but – that was a concerning, concerning game up in Minneapolis for him specifically. I think we have a similar opinion on Jamarcus Lawrence. I think um, we both see what can be, but yeah. there's a difficulty, and we probably knew this going into the year, of like growing in that particular position through while you run through the fire, which is basically what he's going to have to do in Big Ten play. Now, the good thing is we have Sunday's game to bounce off of what happened Wednesday, and he had four assists, two turnovers. It, you know, he, he was uh, better with the ball. Uh, but, yeah, you're right. In the second half, it just got away from him. I, I don't know if it was, you know, Minnesota was feeling it, and they they did have, a, you know, some guys on their end who were had quick hands, and uh, they, they, were, they were confident and bouncy, and uh, he ended up with one assist, seven turnovers. He had – here's the – Part. He actually got going on the offensive side late. Mm -hmm. Like he ended up with like 16 or something. Um, but yeah, it was a disappointing game for him from the point guard spot. I thought the whole offensive setup though, and just the way Nebraska played as a whole unit oh, yeah. was just like discombobulated. And then Jamarcus Lawrence is sort of the face of the turnover problem because he has the ball the most, but it was just a total failed operation in the last 20 minutes. And that's basically what Hoiberg said afterwards. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm still high on what Jamarcus can do at the point guard spot, but I'm realistic that that is a big question mark of him, like being solid and growing through the difficulty of his first season at that position in this league against some guys who are going to really test him. Yeah. And it's, I mean, you've, you've got to be on point with your ball handling in this league with those, those point guards that are going to defend you. I mean, that's just one of those critical aspects of, of all of it, Brian, I'm going to be completely honest with everything going on. I have not looked at single second at Kansas state. So I don't know. Yeah. I don't know if you have any info there, if you've talked uh, or looked or anything with Kansas state basketball, do you have any thoughts ahead of this game on Sunday? Yeah. I, I mean, they're tell you their record. They're eight and two. They're not. Okay, well, there you go. They're not, uh, it's two eight and twos. So it's kind of one of those fun, like, okay, this matches up big game, you know, same deal. Um, they, uh, they're not bad. They're not what they were last year. I don't think, um, they, they, they have beaten Villanova, uh, handily. They beat LSU. They also have like th three games. They won in overtime in a row. Um, and yeah. like w one of them was against, uh, North Alabama. And then there was another one, um, Oral Roberts, maybe, um, where those teams don't have great records, where they really scuffled to get wins. But they do feel like they're finding their feet a little bit if you look mm -hmm. at the results the last week or two. So um, they're going to see it as a big opportunity for them to keep building. They've been very good, as what I just said, in close games. So they're going to be a confident team if this is down to the wire because they've been there, done that, and they've won in those situations. But if Nebraska could go get that one, um, I, I mean, you'd feel really good going to the Christmas near the Christmas break. They still have another game before Christmas, but, um, there's a very good opportunity. If you end up with that one, you will be what? 10 and one in non-conference play, yeah, 10 and one in non-conference. Yeah. And, uh, you could be, and, uh, one and one, which the guy, 
back to Sunday real quick. The thing I liked is the guys acknowledged, maybe they wouldn't have said this if they lost the game, but there was no beating around the bush. They had to have Sunday. Like we can, we can overhype games in December sometimes, but they knew that they needed to get that one to get back to one and one. Now they're with the pack in the big 10 and you go into that January and you're like, all right, we're, we're in the fight like everybody else, as opposed to, Oh, and two, it just feels like, as I wrote the other day, like you lost one of your shoes in the mud. It's just going to be hard. So (laughs) has that happened to you? Um, yeah, yeah, actually see, I, I live a weird, silly life golfing. Yeah. I've lot. I have you ever lo- went after a golf ball like that? You should just let go, and you like I've, I've lost, never like, lost a shoe because of it, I, but I've definitely I've lost- like ruined. You know, you get your feet so wet that they're just freezing the rest of the round, yeah. like stuff like that. But I've never. I can't I've, think that I've ever stepped out of my shoe. I've lost. Where a it wasn't shoe. like forced by someone stepping on it. I lost a shoe. So you that lost was. A shoe? Yeah, in the like mud or something, um, going after a ball. I, I didn't lose it. I should say I lo- I lost it off my foot. I retrieved it. I put okay. it back on. I didn't you play. literally played the rest of the round with one shoe on, like you're the caddy for Happy Gilmore. That would be a better story. But I did get the shoe back. But I I did I, the shoe came off my foot. Gotcha. Gotcha. All right. Well, and I that's what it sure. was. That's what it would have been like if Nebraska were on <laughs> two in league play. <laughs> it would have been miserable. Yeah. Yeah. No see? doubt about it. Uh. All right. We are going to finish things out with what we've been doing the last couple of weeks. We are going to guess a random Nebraska basketball player. BC has selected the player. I will be doing the guessing, and I am very curious where he goes with this. After so far, we have had Jamar Johnson and Tony McRae. Those have been the two. So we've we got wildly different ends of the spectrum, and I am fascinated to see who uh, number three is here. Okay. I'm trying to think. He's definitely Barry Collier era, and I'm trying to think if he caught one of it. He only played at Nebraska two seasons, and this will help get you close to the years. One of the years, uh, I'm not sure if it was a knee year or the first year of Collier, but he definitely played at least one year for Collier. So this should get you close to like the era. Okay. Okay. I, I don't have a guess off of that yet, but I have some names in mind. Okay. I hope I'm right on this detail. I'm like 90% sure. This is me going by my memory, not looking something up. I enjoyed him as a player, so I feel unfortunate to bring this up. But he had an opportunity for a dunk against Kansas in a game everybody was hyped about, and the gym was going to lose their mind. And he uh, clanged it off the back iron, and the ball went backward like to midcourt. Like he missed the dunk against Kansas. I don't have uh, I don't have a memory associated with that, so I'm gonna have to uh, I'm gonna have to need another clue. Okay, he's uh he's from Florida originally, but he spent two seasons at Compton Community College. Hmm. I don't even know if I'm in the right era, but for some reason. I'm going to give you one more clue, okay, and I, yeah. I, I think you'll get it. He's not Kamani friend, but... <laughs> I, I knew that it wasn't Kamani friend. I know, but if I say he's not Kamani friend, but when you kind of associate, when you think of that era, think of like, okay, who was out there I, with Kamani? I don't know why the name I have in my head, I don't even know that it fits, and it's just like one of these that just popped up. And it's like I, I'm struggling to think mentally when he played and why I'm thinking of this. Um, is it Stefan Bradford? That's right. So I had that one. name after the missed <laughs> dunk. And I like I don't have any association of this, but I feel very strongly that we're talking about Stefan Bradford just based entirely off of the fact that he might have played for both Collier and me <laughs> in that time. And I knew it wasn't going to be Kamani friend. And yep. so then I was like, I got to get to the point where I, I feel comfortable saying Stefan Bradford and don't feel like it's the worst miss of all time. It's and a great, it wasn't. great answer. And uh, I really hope for Stefan. I, and he's not remembered by that dunk. It was just one of those. It was almost impressive. Like whoever missed that dunk. And I'm pretty sure it was Stefan. Was that 98 Bradford. or 99? Well, Stefan played with the Huskers from. Uh, <clears throat> he was a. Uh, 
It's also someone I have not thought of in a long time. 2000, 2001 season. He was a Juke All American, by the way. Um, he had 8.1. According to his Wikipedia page, he currently coaches 12 AAU team. I assume that's like under 12. Um, the LES Bulldogs through his company, Life Elite Sports. So, so. I covered, I covered that team for the Daily Nebraskan. And uh, they weren't a great team. They're about 500. But I remember they lost in the Big 12 tournament. And I, I felt like it was a team that was, I don't know, to watch. You weren't exactly inspired by them. But I remember they lost a tough game in the conference tournament. And it was Barry Collier got really emotional, like, because he was saying goodbye to those guys. So that might have been, he might only had one year with with Bradford. But um, he was, I remember he was teary-eyed speaking about those guys and what, what they meant to him. So. Yeah, 99, 2000, 2000, 2001 was his career. He averaged 12 points a game as a senior, 12.8. As a junior, 11.1. He took three three three-point attempts his entire career, but he made one of them. I don't remember that. You probably uh, never wanted him to be the guy shooting free throws with a one-on-one. So those are... Those are the statistical looks at, at Stefan Bradford. I'm I'm excited that that, like I said, when you said the Miss Dunk, that was the first name, but I don't have any memory of it, and I don't know why. I hope it's Stefan. I, I, I'm i like, I'm not for, like, I, I, I hope you miss that dunk. It was just like to, if I pinned it on the wrong guy. But I do remember so well a Husker, and it was, I, almost i would say 90 percent sure stefan because he's a big dude he was going to cram it with authority and the place was going to lose its mind and nebraska was on a run and the it hit the back back iron and went like 45 feet i remember jordan did that in the playoffs against the knicks one time and i was a big jordan kid and i was devastated when jordan had a dunk fly back like 50 feet i remember like looking back on it what a stupid thing to be upset about but i was uh, okay, here we go. After a two-handed dunk by friend brought Nebraska within 45-41, the Huskers had a chance to cut it to two points when Bradford made a steal, went in alone for a dunk that bounced off the back of the rim. That's all it was given? Uh, well, no, there's a full story about how Kirk Heinrich scored 15 of his 20 points in the second What half. was the final? Kansas won 78-74. Oh, that was a good game. Sunday, February 25th. Yeah, Nebraska's uh, pushing them. Yeah, you would not believe what this ESPN page, what it looks like as I'm reading this story right now. Like, this is this is classic go back to 2000s internet. Like, this is incredible. You remember Just the Nebra- Nebraska Kansas game on a Sunday um, where they lost on a they lost by two or something on a jumper late. I oh, I can almost think of the guy's name from Kansas who hit it. But uh, you, you, no, Lank. It's that that's not the same as the Kerry Cohorn game, right? I don't think so. Ray Langford is who hit it. He hit a shot and a Kansas won by one or two. And it was going I'm, on at the, the same time USA was playing Canada in the gold medal hockey match where the NHL guy and Sidney Crosby. And I remember that was a big deal at the time. And so I was watching both flipping between each. I, I really remember that. Yeah. Um, so that was number one, Kansas edges, Nebraska, 88, 87. Yeah, that was a great uh, You game. said Ray Langford when I think you combined Keith Ray Langford. Langford. Keith Langford. You, Keith Langford. You combined great baseball player Ray Langford. <laughs> it's Keith Langford. With, um, with Keith Langford, yeah. Yeah. But it was Keith, Keith Langford. Langford. And he, I don't know if it's him or if it was uh, Aaron Miles that had the free throws at the oh, end of yeah. the, the game that allowed him to beat Nebraska in the Kerry Cohorn game, if you remember what I'm talking yeah. about. People can play the tape. So, As you were correcting me on the name, I did get to it before you spit it out. I just want people. So I was close. I it's in the. I was sitting stuff, on it. I was being polite. There's stuff churning up here sometimes. Um, <laughs> Keith Langford right. was a smooth player, though. But anyway, I know we got to wrap it up. But anyway, that's our Nebraska Kansas uh, Sunday basketball memories from the past. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I mean, look, we did an off-season overtime podcast, <laughs> and quite frankly, it proved uh, to be, uh, you know, predictive, I guess, if you will. So maybe this is all setting up for Nebraska to play Kansas in the NCAA tournament. Second maybe that's round. what's going to happen. Yeah, here. 
we we could do a full podcast of my memories associated with Nebraska, Kansas. It is we unbelievably should. depressing. Unbelievable. I have some great ones. I have some great ones. We should do we should do that sometime because it would be a it would be a collision of like my era of like when Kansas for some reason couldn't win at the Devaney Center for a while mm-hmm. and um your era. Yeah, my era where I <laughs> stood in line for six hours to watch Nebraska score 13 points in the first half, watching Brandon Rush make 37 three pointers all against Nebraska. That that's that's what I have. Sasha Khan just decking people and not getting fouls called on him. I could go. I could go for longer. I'm gonna have to cut myself off here. We'll have to cut it off and just remind that Nebraska won 77 to 70 over Michigan State Sunday, and so that was good. And maybe things are looking up. Yeah, now they're gonna play Kansas State, of which I have real no basketball memories associated with uh, with them, other than seeing Michael Beasley in college. Uh, I think I think that was a game. Bill Walker, who was the other player alongside Beasley, that everybody talked about. Uh, he had to to pee in a towel off the side of the bench because he really needed to go and he wasn't going to get into, he wasn't going to get into the locker room in time. Pretty sure mm-hmm. that happened in the same game. Like that's, that's my Kansas state memories. Alex March put up like 40 some points, I think against them in, uh, in the Bob Devaney uh, where they just, they had no inside guy and Nebraska just kept feeding him. And he could have had 60 points, but he kept missing, you know, two footers. Cause that's kind of Alex March a little bit. We um, should do a, we should do a podcast. This is what we should do. Of old big twelve big, basketball, old big yeah, old big, <laughs> big, 12, big twelve. Yeah, and you go through each team, and we bring up one, like game, like the first game that comes to our mind okay. on that particular team. Like that I would because like I've got, I would have a some I would have some on that. I like this. I, I like this a lot, actually. So we will we will look into that. All right, everybody, appreciate you listening here on the Husker 24-7 Hoops cast. We'll be back next week with another podcast, and we will see if Nebraska is able to get to 2-2 two and two out of this four-game stretch after really looking poor in the first two games. So we'll see how everything goes. For Brian Christopherson, I'm Mike Shaver. We're Husker 24-7. We'll catch you next time.